he moved to Poland to work on uh, virulence blockers of uh, enteropathogenic E. coli at uh, EIT and later on novel we can, uh, vaccines against uh, periodontis at Institute of Immunology and Experimental Therapy of PAS in Warkla, uh, Poland. Uh, uh, please, uh, doctor, uh, if you can share your screen. No problem. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see your screen. You can see it? Yes. Just. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me as well? Eh? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give a talk today. Today, I would like to talk about a special class of compounds. Uh, 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 uh. We don't belong with it, okay? Special class of compounds capable of bypassing any drug resistance. Uh, they were designed originally for something else on the cancer work, but uh, we tested them against uh, human pathogens and surprisingly, they worked very well. So a uh, little bit of uh, background. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a highly drug resistant pathogen. It's especially important in nosocomial infections because it simply escapes a normal antibiotic regimen, has multiple virulent systems, type two and type three secretion systems, which attack the, attack the host directly. Later on in patients, okay, actually type three secretion system is kind of inactivated and there are other mechanisms to uh, survive. And type six secretion system, which is attacking mainly bacteria which is essentially wiping out the competition. Uh, the pathogen has multiple efflux systems and uh, not surprisingly has no commercial vaccine uh, available. So frankly, it is a pretty nasty bag as long as you keep it on the skin and you are not immune compromised, you are fine. But if it gets inside and you have immunity problems, then you are in big trouble. Yersinia enterocolitica is a human pathogen as well. And it is the um, substitute for Yersinia pestis uh, work, oh, I'm sorry, um, which is um, a select class A select agent. Uh, Yersinia pestis is the most lethal human pathogen known. Uh, Yersinia pestis has the resistance to drugs. It's natural and uh, uh, artificial. Uh, I won't go into it, how it was done. Uh, there are multiple virulent systems in the uh, Yersinia, and uh, there is no commercial vaccine. The one which is available is the F1V fusion. It's restricted use, but apparently the pathogen lost the F1 antigen. So frankly, the vaccine is not very useful uh, anymore, and uh, people are looking for alternatives to it. So in our work, uh, we started with different class of compounds. Uh, I will show you structures later, where uh, we try to see if they would really work against those pathogens, especially uh, um, pseudomonas. So essentially we did the old fashioned way. We took the library, we have 250 compounds right now, even more and essentially screen the library against two uh, pathogens that was Yersinia and Pseudomonas. And it was done pretty simple because it was long of the bacteria on the plate. Essentially we spot a little bit of the uh, pathogen, okay? And uh, see if it's a halo. There is no halo, that means there is, a, there is not much of the um, activity. And in that case, okay, we were able to go, well, I don't know why it's going still. Uh, we're going to go to uh, 20 micromolar, okay, uh, a lower screen uh, for the Yersinia enterocolitica and about 200 micromolar for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It was clear cut that Pseudomonas aeruginosa was pretty much resistant to what we had in there. So it is just a representative of what uh, was done. In Yersinia enterocolitica, the transitions were very flat. So frankly, it was difficult for us to get the transition region versus when it, if it was in the um, uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is on the right, uh, it's, I'm kind of blocking here. Uh, so then the transition was much uh, better and we could easily get the IC50. 
Yes, uh, synthetic scheme, that's not the top compounds. Compound number one, this is this one. Okay, and there were essentially two classes of compounds. First one was all linked uh, metallocarburanes that was called icosons. And the other one uh, were the uh, N-linked. Okay, this one is a negatively charged overall. This one is a sweeter ion, so frankly, it behaves differently and has different properties against human cells as well. So we made those compounds uh, and we tested them against two pathogens, uh, Yersinia and Terracolitica. It, was, it is shown for two strains and Pseudomonas aeruginosa again shown for two strains. We could clearly see that uh, for Yersinia, the values were uh, much lower, about five to six times lower than for the uh, 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 Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The first one, this is the starting one. Okay, no derivatives. Two to five, that was the all linked derivatives. And seven, that was the n linked derivative. So uh, we have essentially determined that the values of IC50 are relatively okay for the Yersinia. And the question was uh, could we make uh, cross resistant compounds? Frankly, if we wanted to use them in future as something uh, with the therapeutic value. So for compound number one, okay, we could clearly see that no way we cannot make the resistance to itself. So frankly, if we tested it against compound seven, okay, after nine passages, yes, there was resistance, okay, compound seven to something which we tested against one. And then for three, okay, again, uh, not much of a resistance, okay, seven, okay, again, against it, yes, we can uh, create resistance. So frankly, we could create a different classes depending on how it was uh, uh, structurally, uh, uh, you know, made the compound, we could create a resistance or simply we, we would not be able to create the resistance. So uh, the interesting part, which we did was looking under the microscope, if the resistance generated any morphological changes in the pathogen. So in the first case, okay, when we look at the compound one, which is essentially the starting point, we could barely see any bacteria growing. So it was clear cut that the Yersinia enterocolitica essentially is pretty much killed by the compound. It was a 200 micromolar, okay, uh, nine passages. So uh, we think that the uh, action of this compound on the bacteria is bactericidal. In compound seven and compound three, we could see a bacteria growing. It was just much less. So it was bacteriostatic. But at the same time, we saw that the bacteria were not dividing normally. So frankly, it would be normally like one, two, okay, growing up from there. But might be some other coming, uh, some other bacteria coming up that could be clumps. So we couldn't see those clumps. We could only see uh, two uh, essential uh, bacteria sprouting up, and then, uh, and then uh, suddenly, uh, you know, there was nothing more. So we think that the mechanism of action in this case is um, certainly blocking the cell division. It was reported that it was blocking the it was generating uh, the reactive oxygen species, which was killing the bacteria. But clear cut uh, at the under electron microscope, we do not see any, any cellular damage to the uh, bacterial membranes. So frankly, and uh, the cell wall. So frankly, we think that uh, essentially the reactive oxygen species in this case is not valid, uh, not a valid hypothesis how it would be destroying or blocking the growth uh, of the bacteria. So uh, of course, for the uh, therapeutic value, we wanted to see how well would they behave um, against human cells. So uh, the two to five, I'm sorry, two to five, that was the all linked um, uh, um, compounds. Okay, six to nine, there were the N linked uh, compounds. And we could clearly see that in both cases, that is the, um, mouse fibroblast lane, okay? And this is the human epithelial uh, lung tissue lane, okay? That's a cancerous, it's non-cancerous cell line. And uh, uh, we could see right away that the compounds, okay, were 
the N-link derivatives, okay, uh, were very toxic, and frankly, they were much more toxic for human cells, okay, than for the bacteria. So if we wanted to use them against humans, we would have to have a very specific delivery. Otherwise, it would be simply killing everything. So systemic delivery wouldn't be possible unless coupled with something which will be going straight to the bacterial cells. So maybe antibody or something else. And again, we tested this one for on zebrafish. And in the zebrafish, uh, we saw that uh, compound number one, that was the starting one, wasn't generating much of the uh, morphological, morphological sorry, changes uh, up to four micromole, but then a 10 micromolar, okay, concentration, we could see clearly uh, morphological change that was a scoliosis, okay, that was the pericardial enema. So frankly, it was another deformity, okay, which would see and the tail autophagy, okay. So it was something which you would not like to start, okay, giving to mice because frankly, mice will have deformities. And okay, compound number four, okay, it was pretty much, you know, all fine up to 10 micromole and compound number, uh, four, sorry, four, compound number five, we could see that up to 10 micromole, okay, it was okay. After uh, at 20 micromolar concentration, the uh, uh, fish, okay, it was fish larva were having deformities. It was simply, you know, bending of the spine, it was scoliosis. So in this case, we saw that maybe four and five, okay, were the compounds which we would like to use uh, or develop later on, okay, for the antibacterial treatments, but certainly not compound one, okay, which would be bad. So when we looked a little bit more, okay, up to five days, because after five days, it's kind of, you would need different permit, okay, for those kind of work with larva fish, fish larva, sorry. Mm. So in compound one, okay, we could see right away that at day four, okay, 20 micromolar concentration, uh, frankly, all of the uh, fish larva, okay, would die. And compound four at 20 micromolar as well, okay, but if we lower the concentration, then uh, we saw that uh, essentially about 20% uh, percent of the uh, maximum, okay, of the um, uh, uh, fish larva, okay, died, and it was similar when we had compound number five, and that one was the least toxic compound, and uh, we at even at 20 micromolar concentration, we wouldn't see death in the fish larva. It was tested up to five days. So uh, finally, I would like to thank everybody who took part in it. Chemical synthesis, it was Tomasz Goszczyński, NMR, Waldemar Goldemann, okay, toxicity testing, Anna Naslewicz Goldemann and Mateusz Psurski here in Wrocław and bacterial growth, okay, it was done by myself, okay, and an, in, and an intern who came over to help me, uh, the SEM, electron microscopy, Marek Drap, okay, zebrafish model was developed at the Medical University of Lublin, okay, in Poland, and of course, we would like to thank those who, uh, Help with funding. Okay, that was the NCN, Tomasz Buszczyński, a work on uh, metallocarburanes. Okay, and the grant on um, a development of uh, human vaccines against periodontosis. So your teeth would be staying, staying shiny okay, instead of rotten. Uh, then um, that was uh, given to me, and of course the funding was uh, from the statutory fund. Okay. Uh, Statutory, statutory fund of the institute. So, any questions?